Ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited to be joined by Jim Wall. He is currently serving as a legal counsel for Linford GPM, representing Minneapolis, Minnesota, and has taken on franchising duties to a full effect in over 35 years of franchising experience. He's provided counsel on pretty much every facet of franchising that you can within the industry. So many duties, you know. I must admit it would be tough for me to even address all of your franchising introductions with this little basic script that I've got anyways. But as we've got a tremendous source in front of us, not only as a top franchise legal player, but as someone that can help out a lot of people in the industry. Mr. Wall, thank you for joining us. And first and foremost, I'd like to start here. As far as when you first pursued professional law, how did you end up specializing in franchise law? And what really drew you to this field? The short answer is it was a need of the law firm I was with at the time. I had started out out of law school doing litigation and realized that uh, I would be better suited to a practice where I was helping people put deals together rather than arguing about everything that went wrong. So I was drawn to a transactional business type practice <clears throat> and the law firm that I was working for back in 1988 had a need for a franchise lawyer. So that's kind of how I got started. And uh, it's been a great career ever since. <clears throat> yeah, I can only imagine it's a pretty uplifting position to be able to help that many people in such a quick time frame. And for good reason, you know, that's always a good appealing reason for a lot of people pursuing franchise law in that matter. And not to mention that, but when you've been able to pick up so much experience, I can only imagine that you know, you've been taking a first seat to all the different issues that can exist within the franchising industry, and especially in the wake of the pandemic and all the different changes to the landscape. I can only imagine it's been a little bit different for you, presumably so, as you've made adjustments around COVID-19. But as far as some of the more legal hurdles or the legal challenges that are facing the franchising industry, what are some of those challenges that you really see existing right now? Well, I think the, the biggest challenges actually facing the industry as a whole are basically come under the, the heading of employment law and employment related matters. If you look at any industry publication these days, you'll see articles about problems with staffing. Operators are facing staffing shortages. How do they keep and retain employees? that's sort of the immediate operations level issue and and behind that there are a lot of things going on at the legislative level in the administrative regulatory arena and also in the courts there are a variety of initiatives being pushed by different people different players in the industry you've got um, joint employer issues that are being um, primarily push to address problems in other sectors of the employment area, but they cross over into franchising. Uh, so we've got laws that are aimed at uh, gig workers, for example, Uber drivers and, and things like that. And they're drafted broadly enough that they cross over into raising questions about whether a franchisee is actually employed by its franchisor. And there's a general recognition or, or lack of recognition that these are independently owned businesses. And, and, um, and I think that that's creating a lot of problem in the workplace. So you, you've got these background issues being worked on, uh, joint employer, vicarious liability, minimum wage issues, um, union organizing efforts, all of those things are going on in the background to try to address workers' rights and in income inequality and those kinds of broader societal issues. And they cross over into the franchising area because, as I mentioned, I think there's generally a lack of understanding, at least at the, uh, at the legislative level, that franchisors and franchisees really are independently run businesses. So the more that we can, you know, I and, and others as professionals in the franchise area can help to clarify that separation, that independence, I think that's a, a service that we can provide to both operators and franchisors. 
you know, I think it's incredible to see the multifaceted approach that so many different angles of this business can put together. You mentioned the legislative side on top of just the franchisor and the franchisee perspective. But I think that's a good lead into what I wanted to ask next as far as, you know, some of the more common mistakes that might be existing within the brands itself from the franchisor side and how they handle their legal duties at this point in time. So with the current landscape of what it is, what do you see some of the more common mistakes are from the franchisor side? I, I think it's a, there's a two-part question. I think you have to separate established brands from emerging brands because I think they make different mistakes. Emerging brands are, are focused on growth. They're, you know, I, I work with, uh, I've worked with dozens and dozens of new franchisors over the course of my career. And, and the, the immediate objective always understandably is to to sell a franchise and and then to sell another franchise etc and i think there's a tendency to not focus enough on maintaining brand uh, uniformity focus on really replicating the the quality of the brand that that got the business to a point where people are interested in buying franchises in the first place. So they're, they're often too focused on making deals. They're often making deals with people they probably shouldn't, uh, people who aren't really suited to actually operate the business. They may make uh, changes or modifications in their legal documents that put them in a compromised position three to five years down the road and, and that can happen in various ways but generally for emerging brands i think it's it's a, a tendency to be uh to, to not stand up for the brand enough and not stand up for the legal structure strictly enough uh, on the other hand on on the established franchise or side I, I think that the table kind of flips when a brand has established a track record and uh, a, a stable of, of successful franchisees, I think the tendency tends to sort of switch to wanting to take too much from those operators. And you see that happening in various ways with different fees that are being charged, uh, things that are done in the supply arena where maybe a franchisor or some affiliate is taking too big, uh, having too much control and taking too much of an economic chunk out of supplies that the operator needs to make. And, and obviously that, that's, th there's a balance there, but I, I guess I would say uh, whether it's those kind of supply issues or fee issues or control over operating systems or it, um, it, you know, it could show up in a variety of ways, but there's there's basically that tendency to to want to take too much of a of a chunk out of the operators, and that leads to disputes on a system wide level. Sure, and it really is incredible to see, even within the different specificities of this actual franchise industry, there are so many different intricacies and so many different paths that people can pursue. And, you know, all the more reason to pursue a, a franchising legal professional like yourself, I can only imagine that's some invaluable information that people can pursue. And on top of that, you know, I can only imagine as well, just being in the position that you're in, it's a position where a lot of people are kind of revering the expertise that you're able to put together. And I can certainly anticipate a lot of really sizable relationships that you've been able to put together on that side. So as far as your own passion, what do you really love in particular? What do you love about working with franchise? I love the problem solving side of it and I love the client interaction. Uh, there are clients that I've worked with for over 30 years at this point and uh, some of them, their businesses have, have changed and morphed into something that they really weren't initially, but that's that's part of the joy of working with entrepreneurial clients that uh, they're always responding to mar market changes and uh, different needs that, that they're facing and, and trying to take advantage of. So my job is to help them take advantage of those opportunities and to keep them out of trouble, keep them out of court, hopefully. And I've been pretty successful in doing that. Uh, but it's, it's, been the 
the problem solving and uh, working with creative and entrepreneurial people, I would say those are the, and, and helping people get deals done, helping put things together. That's a very gratifying way of putting it. And I mean, certainly something that the franchising industry is cut for a lot of people to have a lot of positive impact. And it's always right. fun to see people like yourself really making those impacts. And as far as, I have one more question for you, as far as just a parting detail, as far as the advice that you think every prospective franchisee should know about joining a franchise brand. Is there any key information that you really advise a lot of your clients or what do you think everybody should know before joining a franchise brand? Yeah, I should clarify that I, I work strictly with franchisors. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of coming at it from that perspective, but uh, I think it's, it's a two part thing. I, I think they should be looking for a brand that that has a track record and, and the business that has been successfully operated by other people. That that really is the value of getting into a franchise as opposed to doing your own independent business. So look for a, an a, you know at, at least a, a minimally established um, successful business that you can see it has worked well for a number of other operators and beyond that i think you have to be honest with yourself as an operator and do an analysis of of what commitments you're willing to make what skills you have what you bring to the table and does this business opportunity really fit with that you know if you're not somebody that wants to work uh weekends, you, you really shouldn't be looking at buying into a real estate franchise if, or a, a restaurant for that matter. Uh, you know, if you want a, a nine to five type of, of work existence, you, you need to find a, an opportunity that fits with that and not try to force yourself into something that just isn't that type of business model. And then that's pretty basic. But beyond that, I think, uh, to be a successful franchisee, you have to be someone who's willing to accept and implement a system. You're buying into a, a business that has been created by somebody else and there are standards and there are systems and requirements that you're going to be expected to follow. And if your nature is, you know, if you by nature are a person who's always challenging and always questioning and always wanting to do things your own way, you should probably run, you know, create your own business as opposed to buying into a franchise because the franchisor is, is legitimately going to want you to do things their way for the most part. And you've got to be a person who's willing to accept that. We have an absolutely comprehensive take on the franchise. Once again, with over 35 years of experience, Mr. Jim Wall, he is a counsel for Lathrop GPM in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are thrilled to nominate you as one of the top franchise legal players in the entire country. We are overjoyed to continue to monitor all the good work that you're doing. And once again, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a great day.